Welcome back to the saga of the development of the modern suspension bridge. Last lecture, we focused on the first 50 years with emphasis on the first of two great challenges, the rather contentious process of developing suitable configurations for cables and cable anchorages. Today, we'll focus on the second challenge, dealing with the suspension bridge's inherent flexibility and its resulting susceptibility to vibrations caused by the wind. The second challenge was in many ways even more daunting than the first, and it took far more than 50 years to resolve. Yet from this process emerged some of the world's greatest and best known bridges. You've probably seen this infamous video, the undulating, writhing final minutes of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge across the Puget Sound in Washington State. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was the third longest span in the world when it opened to traffic in July 1940. It collapsed just four months later in a steady 42 mile an hour wind. How could this possibly happen? The Tacoma Narrows Bridge had been designed by one of America's leading bridge engineers, Leon Moiseev. When Moiseev completed his design, the suspension bridge was a well-established 140-year-old structure, structural configuration. Comprehensive science-based design processes had been in place for over a century and were continually improving. Given all of this accumulated expertise, experience, and science, how could a major structure fail so catastrophically under loading conditions that weren't even particularly extreme? The answer to this question is a complex one which encompasses the full history of modern suspension bridge development from the early 19th century to the present day. This story is the subject of today's lecture. Now, last lecture we met Guillaume Henri Dufour, the Swiss engineer who built the world's first permanent wire cable suspension bridge in 1823. One year earlier, before the bridge was actually constructed, as part of the design process, Dufour built a large-scale model of that bridge spanning about 40 feet, and he used that model to test his design concept. Dufour's model used an unstiffened deck, as I have shown here in my model. And indeed, this configuration, the cable supporting a deck which isn't stiffened with a truss or any other means, was actually the most common configuration used in the earliest suspension bridges, those occurring in the early 1800s. So it was entirely appropriate that Dufour was experimenting with this configuration in, con in conjunction with his design. Uh, Dufour kept very careful records of his work, and as we look at his journals, we see some extremely astute observations about how this sort of unstiffened suspe suspension bridge behaves. He noted, for example, that when he placed a heavy load at mid-span on his model, the center of the span dipped down violently and the ends of the span lifted up an equivalent amount. He then noted that he moved that heavy concentrated load to the one quarter point along the length of the span and the one quarter point dipped down precipitously and the opposite end lifted up an equivalent amount. What Dufour was observing was the inherent flexibility of the cable as a structural form. And that flexibility derives directly from the mechanics of a draped cable, as we saw back in Lecture 8. What we saw there, and what is clearly evident in the unstiffened deck suspension bridge, is that the shape of a cable is highly dependent on its loading. And as the load changes, the shape changes in direct response to that load in order to preserve equilibrium. In his experiments, Dufour also noticed that the unstiffened deck was extremely susceptible to vibrations. Every time he loaded it, he saw continual oscillations occurring even after he removed the load. This sort of unstiffened deck can vibrate in several different modes. The two most important are a longitudinal mode, which occurs when one side of the bridge deck moves downward and the opposite side lifts up. 
That sort of oscillating mode back and forth, up and down, looks something like this. And the alternative vibrational mode is a twisting or torsional mode in which the bridge deck twists violently from side to side. And you may remember that form of motion from the video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Now, Dufour's tests on his model were well conceived and well implemented. They clearly reflected the efforts of a man who understood that a wholly new structural form might be susceptible to wholly unanticipated forms of behavior. His observations about the flexibility of his model were entirely accurate. However, the conclusion he drew from these observations was, in a way, fundamentally flawed. Dufour concluded that a suspension bridge's susceptibility to vibration could be reduced by making it heavier. And he wasn't alone in this conclusion either. The following year, 1823, Claude Navier made essentially the same flawed assertion in his very influential report on American suspension bridges. Specifically, Navier concluded that a longer span would be inherently more stable than a shorter one solely because of its larger mass. Now, at first glance, this conclusion might seem like an entirely reasonable application of Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration, F equals ma. Suppose we have two objects, one heavy and one light. If we apply exactly the same force to each of those objects, the lighter object will in fact experience a larger acceleration. The heavier one will accelerate less. So, in a sense, we can think of mass as a measure of resistance to acceleration. A greater mass resists acceleration more effectively, which is just what Dufour and Navier were saying. The problem is that this reasoning only addressed half of the problem. Force equals mass accel times acceleration also tells us that any mass, no matter how large, will be set in motion by an unbalanced force. A heavy object will accelerate less than a light, light one, but it will accelerate. And once it's in motion, a more massive body is more resistant to deceleration as well. In short, a heavy bridge is harder to set in motion, but once it's in motion, it's also harder to stop. Newton's second law is a two-edged sword. What neither Dufour nor Navier realized was that under certain conditions, a bridge deck vibrating in that torsional mode that we just saw can experience a phenomenon called aeroelastic flutter, in which each of those oscillations interacts with the wind to create an aerodynamic force that reinforces the oscillations. In other words, because of the interaction of the moving air and the elastic structure, each oscillation tends to make the next oscillation larger. Although there's still some scientific debate on the subject, aeroelastic flutter was the most likely cause of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse, as you probably expected. The phenomenon is actually quite complex, but for our purposes here, we really just need to remember three key points. First, flutter is very strongly influenced by the very specific shape and proportions of the bridge deck. Second, for a given shape, there's actually a characteristic wind speed at which flutter is most likely to occur. And by the way, it's important to recognize that flutter does occur at a constant wind speed. It doesn't require gusts or any other unusual conditions. And third, the effect of flutter is far more severe if the bridge deck is torsionally flexible, if it can twist easily. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. Now, as bridge engineers would eventually learn, the best way to prevent excessive vibration in a suspension bridge is not to make it heavier, but to make it stiffer by adding a substantial stiffening truss or stiffening girder to the structure. So let's return to my model of the unstiffened suspension bridge and let's add our stiffening truss. Here we have the stiffening truss. We put it in place. And now I'll add, uh, I'll apply those same loads that Dufour applied in his experiments. First, we'll take that load and we'll apply it at mid-span. And you'll notice that that former tendency of the cable to distort significantly is essentially gone. It's, it's absent. I apply the same load out here at the one quarter point, And once again, the tendency of the cable to distort under the action of that load is 
almost entirely eliminated. And so what we see is that the stiffening truss distributes concentrated loads longitudinally so that multiple suspenders are involved in carrying that load. As a consequence, the cable stays stable. But what we also see is that the tendency of this bridge to vibrate is now significantly reduced. And the stiffer the truss, the less is the tendency to vibrate. Some of the earliest suspension bridge designers did experiment with the use of stiffening trusses like this one, but the idea that long spans are more stable because of their mass persisted long after the stiffening truss had become relatively commonplace in, in engineering practice. And this misconception was particularly dangerous because many bridge engineers continue to think of mass as a substitute for the stiffening truss, particularly on long span suspension bridges. Largely because of this misconception, the development of suspension bridges has been plagued by catastrophic collapses caused by wind-induced vibration. Many early American, British, and French bridges were blown down in windstorms. Sir Samuel Brown's Chain Pier at Brighton is a vivid example, if only because the failure was so well documented. The chain pier was built in 1823 as a landing for ships sailing between the southern coast of England and France. It was also a very popular promenade. The structure was, in effect, a one-ended suspension bridge, 1,154 feet long, with four cast iron towers supporting six iron eye bar chains. And as you can see in this photo, the deck was, in fact, unstiffened, the characteristic that almost certainly caused its destruction in a storm in 1896, as you can see in these photos. Even Thomas Telford's Menai Strait Bridge was badly damaged by a windstorm 13 years after it was built and had to be strengthened. But perhaps the greatest bridge failure of the 19th century, and certainly the most consequential, occurred in 1854. On May 17th of that year, the world's longest bridge, Charles Ellett's Wheeling Bridge over the Ohio River, was destroyed by a heavy wind. A newspaper reporter who observed the collapse provided this description in the next day's Wheeling Intelligencer. For a few moments, we watched it with breathless anxiety, lunging like a ship in a storm. At one time, it rose nearly the height of the towers, and then it fell and twisted and writhed and was dashed almost bottom upward. At last, there seemed to be a determined twist along the entire span, and down went the immense structure from its dizzy height to the stream below with an appalling crash and roar. The similarity between this description and the video of the Tacoma Narrows collapse is absolutely stunning. There is no doubt that the underlying cause of failure is the same in both cases. Now, at this point, you may be wondering how the Wheeling Bridge could have collapsed in this way when it very clearly has stiffening trusses in this photo. Well, the answer is simple. The stiffening trusses were added later when the bridge was rebuilt in 1859. The engineer for this reconstruction project was a man named William McComas, an associate of Ellett's. But before McComas began his design, the board of the Wheeling Bridge Company paid him to travel north to Niagara Falls to visit a newly constructed suspension bridge over the Niagara Gorge. This particular bridge had defied conventional wisdom by carrying both a road and a railroad over the gorge. Most experts of this era maintained that the suspension bridge was inherently unsuitable for heavy railroad loads. And in addition to being able to carry railroads, this bridge had also proved to be extraordinarily resistant to wind loads. The Wheeling Bridge Company requested that McComas go to Niagara and learn everything he could about this revolutionary new bridge and incorporate these lessons into his design for the reconstruction of the Wheeling Bridge. The designer of that revolutionary Niagara Falls Bridge was Charles Ellett's principal competitor, a man who would now succeed Ellett as America's greatest bridge engineer, a man we already know well, John Roebling. Ironically, John Roebling had made a name for himself building the one form of suspension bridge that truly does not require stiffening, the aqueduct. His first bridge was the Allegheny Aqueduct Bridge at Pittsburgh, which is no longer with us, but a very similar bridge that he designed just two years later in 1847 has survived. 
and is now the oldest wire cable suspension bridge in the United States. This unique structure was designed to carry the Delaware and Hudson Canal across the Delaware River at Lackawaxen, Pennsylvania. In its original form, the wooden framework that surrounds the suspension cables, as shown in this photo, was actually fully enclosed and watertight so that the canal could flow through it above the level of the river. Now, an aqueduct suspension bridge doesn't require stiffening because the weight of the water flowing through the aqueduct channel is perfectly uniform. An unbalanced loading, which would distort the cable, is essentially impossible. Even when one of those heavy canal boats crossed the bridge, it displaced water equal to the weight of the barge, so the uniformity of the loading was unaffected all along the length of the span. This old photo shows the original channel of the canal passing across the bridge, though in this case without water. Note on the right-hand side the towpath that was used by mules pulling the canal boats. Today, this bridge has been refurbished and is used for automobile traffic. And yes, a stiffening truss has been added to accommodate this new non-uniform load that it now experiences as a result of traffic crossing the span. In the 1840s, while John Roebling was still building aqueducts, he was also studying Charles Ellett's bridges. And based on what he saw, he devised a better system for stabilizing suspension bridges against wind-induced vibration. He had the opportunity to prove his system when he won the contract to build that combined road and railroad bridge at Niagara Falls, shown here. This structure, completed in 1855, demonstrates the effectiveness of Roebling's solution. The Niagara Gorge Bridge also dispelled that common belief that suspension bridges couldn't be used successfully as railroad bridges because of the excessive weight of locomotives. The most unique aspect of this structure is that it was a double-deck bridge with the railroad line running on top and a carriageway down below. Mark Twain has left us with a wonderful account of what it was like to cross this bridge on the carriageway. You drive over the suspension bridge, Twain wrote, and divide your misery between the chances of smashing down 200 feet into the river below and the chances of having a railway train overhead smashing down onto you. Either possibility is discomforting, taken by itself, but mixed together they amount in the aggregate to positive unhappiness. Twain's unease notwithstanding, this bridge was solid thanks to Roebling's unique system for stiffening the structure. The system reflects what engineers call a belt and suspenders approach. That is, two different systems, independent of each other, each capable of doing the job on its own, but combined to provide an even higher level of safety. Roebling's system consisted of two elements. First, very deep iron stiffening trusses, which you can very clearly see in this drawing. This is the belt. And second, the suspenders are two sets of iron stay cables, one radiating out from the towers down to the tops of the stiffening trusses, and the other anchored on the cliffs below and connected to the bottoms of the trusses. Look closely and you'll be able to see these cables in the drawing as well. This system very effectively prevented both vertical movement and twisting of the bridge deck. It was used with great success on all of Roebling's subsequent bridges, including the Brooklyn Bridge. Here you can see those very robust stiffening trusses on the Brooklyn Bridge. And here's that web of diagonal stay cables radiating out from the towers to the trusses. Although the Niagara Falls and Brooklyn Bridges were designed during the period when science-based engineering methods were just taking hold, it's clear that empirical methods still figured prominently in the design of these structures. The dynamic behavior of a suspension bridge due to wind loading was simply too complex for the analytical tools of the era to predict structural performance reliably. So engineers like John Roebling also relied very heavily on experience and on testing. Over time, however, scientific methods continued to improve and engineers' reliance on these methods continued to increase. As the traditional empirical methods faded from view, bridge engineers somehow forgot the lessons reflected in Roebling's successful system for resisting wind loads. It's hard to say exactly how this collective amnesia occurred, 
But it's most likely that the increasing accuracy of science-based methods led engineers to view Roebling's empirical belt and suspenders approach as obsolete. In practice, their uncritical faith in science-based methods would prove to be unfounded. In the 1920s and 30s, Leon Moiseev emerged as America's leading suspension bridge engineer. Moiseev was a Latvian who emigrated to the U.S. at age 19 and earned a civil engineering degree from Columbia University. After gaining experience on several major American bridge projects, he earned great notoriety by developing a new science-based methodology for suspension bridge design called deflection theory. Now, one of the principal implications of this theory was that long-span suspension bridges don't require stiffening trusses because their mass will stabilize them against wind-induced vibration. Sound familiar? Moiseev's assertion might well have been taken directly from the pages of Navier's report of 1823, 100 years earlier. And how did the bridge engineering community respond to a theory that had been so thoroughly discredited by such events as the collapse of Ellet's Wheeling Bridge? Well, apparently, they loved it. Charles Ellis applied Moiseev's deflection theory in the design of the famed Golden Gate Bridge. And Moiseev was even hired as a consulting engineer on the project. Othmar Amon applied Moiseev's deflection theory in his design for the George Washington Bridge. Note the incredibly slender, unstiffened deck in this bridge's original configuration. And of course, Moiseev applied his deflection theory in the design of his own Tacoma Narrows Bridge. He rather <clears throat> modestly called this structure the most beautiful bridge in the world because of its slender profile, which resulted from the use of this very light, shallow, stiffening girder rather than the more robust trusses favored by John Roebling. Well, we already know how this story ends. And just as Galloping Gertie collapsed, so did Leon Moiseev's deflection theory. We know today that the theory was an oversimplification, that it failed to account for the very complex interactions between the flow of air around a bridge deck and the dynamic response of the structural system. Today, this case has become a symbol of the dangers of arrogance born of overconfidence in science-based design methods. And in the immediate aftermath of the collapse, the Golden Gate Bridge was retrofitted by adding substantial additional lateral bracing to increase the torsional stiffness of those trusses. Prior to the retrofit, the newly completed Golden Gate Bridge had actually been experiencing significant, unexpectedly large vibrations, even in moderate winds. In 1950, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was rebuilt, this time with a very substantial stiffening truss, as you can see here. And even though the George Washington Bridge experienced no major problems with wind in its first 30 years of service, a new lower deck and heavy stiffening trusses were added in 1962, as you can see here. These significantly increased its stiffness, so the possibility of wind-related problems is now minimal in this bridge. It seems to me that belt and suspenders engineering has made a bit of a comeback. The late 20th century has seen dramatic new approaches to dealing with wind effects and suspension bridge design. These new approaches were stimulated first by the Tacoma Narrows collapse and then by the development of wind tunnel technologies and highly sophisticated computer models which can model complex airflows and predict the associated structural response in suspension bridges. One of the most spectacular products of this effort is the Severn Bridge in Britain, described as the most significant innovation in suspension bridge design in the entire 20th century. The Severn Bridge was originally designed with a conventional stiffening truss, but before, long before the bridge was actually built, because of concerns about wind-induced vibration, a highly accurate physical model of the truss was constructed for wind tunnel testing. But during the testing, the model broke free from its mountings and was destroyed in the laboratory. It took a long time to build a replacement model, and while waiting for it to be delivered, the engineers decided to try some experiments with a very simple aerodynamically shaped box girder. 
The test proved to be so unexpectedly successful that the design was modified to incorporate this aerodynamic box girder rather than stiffening trusses. Severn Bridge was constructed in 1966 with a main span of over 3,000 feet. It features two significant innovations that were intended to address the challenge of wind-induced vibration in fundamentally new ways. The first is that aerodynamically shaped box girder shown here in a cross-sectional view. Not only does this girder resist wind-induced vibration by virtue of its aerodynamic shape, but it's also inherently resistant to torsion. And to emphasize that point, I'd like to show you a quick comparison. This flat plate, simple piece of flat wood, is by virtue of its shape highly flexible in torsion. It's very easy to twist. This is in effect the equivalent of the stiffening girder of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This wooden hollow tube uses exactly the same amount of wood as my flat plate, but it is extremely torsionally stiff. I really can't twist it at all. And that stiffness re uh, results from the fact that it is a closed shape. The closed shape in comparison with a flat plate causes a structural shape to have a significantly greater amount of torsional strength and stiffness. And that is the source of that additional stiffness that we find in that aerodynamically shaped box girder on the Severn Bridge. The second innovation is the use of suspenders that are not vertical, but rather are arranged as a series of V shapes, as you can see here in this photo. The suspenders effectively turn the cable system into a truss, further enhancing its stiffness. The result of these innovations is a bridge that approaches the same level of graceful, slender appearance as that original unstiffened George Washington Bridge, but now with a far greater level of stability. Many modern suspension bridges have followed the lead of the Severn Bridge in using an aerodynamically shaped girder profile. And all of them are designed using wind tunnel and computer simulations to accurately characterize their dynamic response to wind loading. I think it's fair to say that with the construction of the Severn Bridge, the battle against the wind has finally been won. During the past two lectures, we've experienced the saga of suspension bridge development from the early 19th century through the present day. It's a powerful story about the roles of theory and practical experience in the development of technology, and about the pitfalls of over-reliance on either approach. But most importantly, it's a human story one in which human aspirations and ingenuity were pitted against human frailty. Many of the bridges in this great saga are still around for us to admire, and all of them are great structures. When you encounter these bridges, I hope you'll see them as something more than just assemblies of iron and steel, stone and concrete. In Samuel Brown's Union Bridge, those iron eye bar chains are direct reflections of a proud British tradition of pragmatism and engineering. In Charles Ellett's Wheeling Bridge, we see a majestic thousand foot span that was dashed to pieces by the wind and then reborn with John Roebling's belt and suspenders providing the stiffness it needed to endure for another 150 years. In John Roebling's Delaware River Aqueduct, we see a unique little structure hidden away in the wilds of northeastern Pennsylvania, yet a bridge that helped foster a revolution in suspension bridge technology. In the incomparable Golden Gate and George Washington bridges, we see great structures that might not be here today if that disastrous failure of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge hadn't shocked the engineering community into dealing with the challenge of wind-induced vibration. And most importantly, in John and Washington Roebling's masterwork over the East River in Lower Manhattan, we see that one structure in our story that got everything right. Its solutions to the challenge of fabricating and anchoring cables set the standard for all the bridges that were to follow. And though its solution to the challenge of wind-induced vibration was eventually superseded, it was nonetheless entirely effective and it continues to be effective today. The Brooklyn Bridge is also, as best I know,
the world's only suspension bridge that has a pedestrian walkway that's elevated completely above the vehicular roadway. Next time you visit New York City, I encourage you to take a stroll across the river on that walkway. When you do, you'll be isolated above the maddening traffic, surrounded by that amazing network of cables. John Roebling's successful but much underappreciated solution to the battle against the wind. From that vantage point, you'll be in a perfect position to admire the four main cables that set a new course for bridge design all over the world. And when you look at those huge, seemingly solid cables, I hope you'll visualize that little spinning wheel carrying a single loop of steel wire across the East River over 10,000 times to solve a problem that had plagued bridge engineers for 50 years and to literally change the course of engineering history. Along the way, I hope you'll appreciate that a great structure is not just the stuff it's made of, it's also the people who made it, the way they made it, and the obstacles they overcame to make it a reality. Thank you.